pastor, which should the pledge receipt that we have to write the pledge receipt that you are doing well, prone to a lot of errors. So congratulations to the LRA, all of that. Okay, so um, we were supposed to talk about digitization and how it enhances sustainable domestic revenue mobilization. So, without delay, we wouldn't go into defining what digitization is because we've seen the progress that the LRA has made from the video and all of the testimonies. Um, so, we just want to highlight the, um, the progress that has been made from our angle from the Central Bank of Liberia in terms of modernizing the payment systems to support all of the efforts that we were talking about. Um, if you hear the commercial banks talk about providing a platform for even revenue collection seamlessly, we want you to know that in the back end, there's a system that has been provided by the Central Bank of Liberia to ensure that um, taxes are paid seamlessly to the government account. So that means if the commercial banks collect the revenue, they are also connected to the central bank for easy credit to the government of Nigeria for some of the revenue. So that's where the flow comes from. So like I said, prior to that, we had a 100% manual system as well at the central bank of Nigeria. And because of the payment systems modernization project, we were able to have connectivity with all of the commercial banks. And that is at the large value component of our modernization. Efforts are being made to go to the digital payment sector as mentioned by the Minister of Finance. So um, I just wanted to highlight a few critical enablers of domestic revenue mobilization. First, I have a conducive legal and regulatory framework for taxation, um, I was reviewing the LRA's website, and you can see that there are laws, tax laws, and all of that to support domestic revenue collection. From a payment systems perspective, I would like to highlight infrastructure and technology that is going to facilitate digital means of collecting taxes. Without technology, you cannot digitize. And the infrastructure is as low as a mobile technology. If you look at the number of mobile money subscribers that we currently have in Nigeria, which is approximately million, five million um, subscribers, which in, in another sense we have multiple subscriptions, one person having multiple wallets you will see that we have a very low hanging fruit that can be leveraged for the digitization of payments. As well, the commercial banks are also providing their platforms to support domestic revenue collection and enhance compliance by taxpayers. If you look at uh, what the LRA is currently doing, the LRA is currently moving to a new platform for tax collection. But it is also important to know that the last mile has to be achieved. And the last mile is the point where the consolidated um, revenue account is credited. So it is equally important to collaborate with other regulators or other players to enhance the process. Another critical area to enhance the wealth state or revenue mobilization is public confidence in the tax system, which is anchored on comprehensive rate management framework. There's a need to ensure that there are policies in place that promote tax compliance, that promotes um, tax payers um, redress in terms of dispute. And, and all of that. And then I also have creating the media awareness and taxpayer literacy. There's a need for individuals to know how they're supposed to pay their tax, what are the different kind of taxes that are needed to be paid, and all of that. Financial education.
Inflation is one thing that cannot be ruled out if you're talking about sustained domestic revenue mobilization. So I think the LRA has done more in that area. And, and what can be done? The LRA has to also create awareness in terms of the alternative delivery channels that are available. I spoke about the use of mobile technology. That is a very much low hanging fruit because of the amount of station. We also have fintech in, in our industry, the likes of Tipney and other fintech that have been um, lessened by the central bank of Nigeria. And all of those can be leveraged for the investment of domestic revenue mobilization. I thought to highlight few benefits of the digitization process in two perspectives. One from the taxpayers' end. It is cost saving once you move to a more digital platform to pay your taxes. We talk about financial inclusion because we have access to a wide range of financial services, including savings accounts, credit, and insurance products. We talk about more effective transactions, effective and efficient transactions, convenience, okay? Like I spoke about the manual process that was ongoing back then. If you move to a more digital platform, it will be far more easier to have taxpayers comply. Digitization also serves as a payment gateway and provide an effective and secure way that is less when it comes to fraud. Increased accessibility, especially for rural dwellers. Those are all benefits for taxpayers. If you're in a rural area, you can easily pay your tax seamlessly without going through additional costs of coming to Monrovia as was done before. And I thought to highlight the benefits of digitization relative to the LRA and the government of Liberia. We talk about increased domestic revenue mobilization to facilitate government's expenditure. We all need to pay our taxes to support the, the budget in terms of infrastructure and healthcare delivery. That's one benefit to the government. It increases transparency through accurate reporting. Again, financial inclusion, that means um, people can have access to financial services either through the bank, through the bank or the, the NNOs or the FinTech, and whichever service provider that's available. And thus reducing poverty and achieving economic growth. And lastly, one critical importance of digitization to the government is increasing the lifespan of the domestic currency. Once you have people using electronic ways of payment, the lifespan of the bank loans is going to be enhanced, and the government will go through the extra expenditure of printing bank loans from time to time. In conclusion, I want to say that the COVID-19 pandemic has given us no choice but to ensure that we provide alternative delivery channels for payments, and the LRA is successfully doing that as well as other players in our ecosystem. It is, however, important to consider leveraging current evolving technology and, digital, and the digital payment landscape of Liberia. So if you look around and see what's obtaining the banks on top of the initial implementation of the payment systems by the central bank, most of the banks have been innovative enough to provide additional value proposition to enhance you know, the customer's experience. So if you talk about OMI being provided by Echo Bank or any platform or any commercial bank or the fintech, it is all built on that enabling environment in terms of the, the infrastructure that was provided. So we have something to start with. Why don't we promote the usage of what we have whilst we improve on additional services to, to facilitate um, domestic revenue mobilization. And this can only be achieved
she threw for that foundation of all of the stakeholders. Like I said, the LRA is having a new platform for tax collection, but that they're now working as a mission. They need of sharing APIs, building data ways to ensure that if the revenue is collected, whether from a commercial bank channel or mobile technology channel, how does it terminate into the consolidated revenue account as another component that falls within the purview of the central bank of Nigeria? Because we are the custodian of government's funds, so that has to be done in terms of ensuring that we reach the last hour where the revenue sits in the account of the government for timely decision making. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, I just want to say first and um, foremost, thanks to Yami for the opportunity to discuss um, the way forward how to get together down, um, and so, which I think is very, very um, realistic, given my experience in the space. The lady in so, I'll start first by throwing out some of the center so, bank um, this we of the UIV, and of speaking where I'm right from. now is Africa has the fastest growing digital um, mobile phone penetration in the world. Liberia has a population of approximately 5 million. And you'll be surprised to know because um, usually I hear people talk about um, and speaking now is the man, Mr. Oliver. Oliver. Part of the country. But the number shows that of 5 million, 3.3 million of um, citizens are connected by mobile phone. Of that 3.3 million, 2.9 are smartphone users. So what this means that this means that we have and people have access to digital platforms. So what, what are we using them for? Facebook, Instagram. So this is where my discussion points come into play. And I'll just um quote some statistics um, from I'll go as far back as 2012. Research done by a company called Strategy and Co. Um, this is uh, in 2012, in 2011, digitalization contributed to the world economic boost of $193 million, just by 2000. The same report states that a poor company, emerging countries, emerging markets, can increase or improve their poorest people. Digital uh, digitalization in the school, or double that, within a 10 years period, that would create $4.4 trillion, $4.4 trillion increase in nominal GDP. This translates to about, uh, this translates to about uh, $930 billion contribution. And this also will create 64 million new jobs. It will take, I will, I will use the common term, it will take our soul from other streets. It will just use technology within our country. So imagine if you can employ a thousand zogos and you're collecting, and I'll just go from a basic point, and collecting, let's say, 10 hours from them as income tax on a monthly basis. Do the bad. I'll go a step further. If we um, talk about digitalization, this, it has to do with an entire ecosystem. So my company started the process back in um, 2014, and this was mainly driven by Ebola. So during the Ebola process, we saw that a government agency had to be shut down, and only 25% of the workforce had to appear. So what that did, that took a deep dive in government revenue being generated over the period, because um, if you have only 25% of the workforce going, people who needed basic government services could not 
obtain them or could I get access to them? So what we started with um, was building e-government and e-governance platforms. So that's the ecosystem first. Because if I have a business and I'm in Marshall, but I have to leave from Marshall to go to um, registry, um, to the business registry, to register my business, which normally takes about three days to a week or even longer, I'm not going there. I'll be very honest with you, I'm not going there. Because just the transportation calls back and forth from Marshall to the library. The transportation calls and then whatever costs they may involved in the process, whether um, it's feeding me the Windows figure, it will be a lot more high than the 50 or 40 dollars I will have to pay to register my business. We then started within that period, um, we interviewed about 50 businesses within the Pinsville and Dunbar area. About 90% of them were not registered. And it was the very same reason because folks felt that if I have to go to LIBR for over a week to register my business, I'm not going. So do the math at 50 dollars per business at 1,000 businesses annually that have not been registered. The number's a lot higher, and this is just most of what I've done. The number's a lot higher. How much revenue government is losing within the process? If I have to go to the Ministry of Transport and stand in a queue for two hours or even longer over a week or three weeks period just to get um, my vehicle registered, more than likely I'm not doing that. I'll find a way around. More than likely I'm not doing that. But then also we realize that even if we build this ecosystem, what the leads to is compliance. So by enforcing compliance inadvertently, you raise revenue. And what do I mean by this? Um, we all drive around here on, no, on every day. How many cars pass by you in the opposite end? How many cars just run in real life? We did a study and we built a system that was um, tested by the LP and LRA. Um, it was called L um, LP Traffic. So what the system does is um, we digitize the entire ticketing process. So if a police officer were to pull a vehicle over, instead of um, just taking your license away, they already have a system that ties with Ministry of Transport that shows that the vehicle is registered just by typing in your plate number. It also shows that your license is valid just by typing in your license number or by scanning your license. So by enforcing compliance, I can pull any vehicle over today and know that this car is registered one. Um, there's an existing ticket on this car that has not been paid. I don't need to see that you have a license because every ticket that was given is appended it's attached, it's, um, attached to the car and the vehicle. So just by enforcing compliance, we can generate more revenue. I was to show over that period we did um, sample size of 150 officers. About let this do 100 officers, and you give them a quota, say um, seven tickets per day, 20 days in a month. Average face value of the ticket five dollars. That's about 210 thousand. Monthly from LMP. If you study the numbers given by LMP right now, I can almost guarantee you they don't contribute 100 or 210,000 to government revenue on any given month. And this is just on vehicle revenue. Uh, this is just on moving violations. So the entire ecosystem has to be built. LRA is doing a great job on um, the tax on um, collections issues on um, using um, mobile money, tip me, and other um, payment platforms. But to be able to expand that, it has to be an entire ecosystem that needs to be built. And we're talking about an ecosystem that includes, if I needed to get a passport, I should be at home for midnight, enter the necessary information, upload them, and be able to know when my passport is available. So I should be home and, and upload my birth certificate, upload my passport as a picture, Upload all necessary information. Someone at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Passport Division, gets that information, validate, and then from that very same system, correspond with me that, okay, this is where you are with the entire process, this is what needs to be done next. Instead of me going to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, sitting in the Palawa House for the next three, four hours, and don't even know if I'm going to get called in that day, and they have to come back the very next day. But stay home, pay that money and then be able to get my, my passport without taking one step. 
to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That is saving me money, but it also increases efficiency within the process. What that leads to is we have a lot more people who will be willing to apply passport. Same thing with vehicle registration. Same thing with business registration. A lot more people will register their businesses and don't have to go to LIBR. Imagine um, Ganta. How many businesses are in Ganta? If the LIBR was to do a study or do images on an assessment, in most metropolis around the country, Ganta, Greenville, Banga, you will find that more than 70% of the businesses, whether in formal sector or not, are not registered. They are not registered. But what this does is now if you enforce compliance, you have data to go with. So everybody knows that this year we have about 200 businesses registered. Now you start to use that data and, and analyze that for projections into the next year. Now you can use that data for any government revenue um, for the next year, so okay. Based on the information we got last year, we know that uh, from domestic revenue we know, we, we have this amount that we can project. And if we even do, um, we still got 5% burn rate or burn rate, or maybe we still got 10% incremental rate, so every year we increase that number by 10%, we have data that we can work with. Now, policy make us know that um, Bangar gives us, um, they have more businesses going in Bangar because last year they have 50 businesses to register and the following year they have about 100. So what's happening in Bangar? What are the economic activities that are going on within Bangar City that's driving businesses to be registered? Now we're looking at employment hot zone. We're looking at half. So things that are happening in Bangar that are driving businesses to be open uh, information that government can now use to serve if people need a hospital in Bangladesh because most people move in Bangladesh. So that's employability within the environment. And then that again leads to taxes, income tax. And as more people move in Bangladesh because there are jobs that are being created, more businesses will open. A key example that I read earlier before I moved here, that particular area only people were selling, but after I moved, how many restaurants open around it? Even in the industrial complex, we can say for a fact. Until the industrial complex moved here, how many restaurants were around here? How many other businesses were around there? But then again, we'll come back to the entire digitalization process also and the um, ecosystem that we're here to build. So now, um, developers and businesses will see opportunities. So now I know that most of the ministries are no longer in town. They are in Bangor town. If I'm a business on Bangor Street, I will have a digital presence. That if um, John Brown working with Ministry of Labor wants to buy a shoe, and he knows that he only has Saturday to get in town to buy that shoe, he knows for a fact that before Saturday he might use that money. But if there's a start, um, H and A have a digital platform where I'm working, um, LRA, like uh, um, Ministry of Labor, I can buy my shoes without leaving my office, and it gets delivered to me. That's business will do it, but that shit has to be delivered, that's money that has to be paid, and that digital platform will integrate with the local current um, campaign, it will integrate with mobile money, integrate with orange money, that payment, and then there's a VAT component, so we now lose per business activities just by creating this ecosystem. We spur business activities, so this is what um, my, my, my take will be before I leave from here. Um, I could go and talk about this for the next um, 30 minutes of all my because I'm so passionate about this. If we just use technology within our country, I think what we're gonna do is, it's an honest statement, quite frankly. Yeah. It is. We can go a lot higher than that. No, we may have our budget supported 100% by domestic revenue, just by building digital environment, digital ecosystem, enforcing compliance, we have enough information for them to drive our economic growth, youth employability, um, digital literacy, stability, because the more people make money in, the more financial, uh, their security and conditions, I don't really want any upheavals if I'm earning money I can feed myself. And not to be funny, but before I conclude, the more people are able to afford, the less of we have this, I will say. Because if I have to go to work, I will never be trying to thank anybody else. Thank you.
So that was the voice of Mr. Oliver Clark, the CEO of Mobile Git Technologies. He is speaking at the second national revenue symposium. So just joining us, we would like to say welcome, keep following as we continue on this live podcast at the Ministry of Congress here in Kampata.
background when I want to move on to our panel. Um, I don't know, IT is, is the people's, I mean, uh, we still have our panelists online. Yeah, all right. So, um, there's one critical area where we won't need to question and answers, and I'm sure many of you have questions for them. But a lot of them spoke about uh, enabling legislation. I have a concern on that because I think that too came out as some workshop I attended. Is where that we was the voice of the CEO of Tipman Liberia? So my view, my concern is about the, um, the improvement in technology. If you try to Miss Lorraine Golio, I hope I get the pronunciation correct. That was the technology of the CEO How do you tie that of Tipmay, Liberia, uh, Lorraine. That would come up maybe if we can start out with the Mecca and he has some regional perspective because that is a key source of concern. Because a law, when you pass a law, you change it to, it, it, it's not easy. You come to a lot of politics, but then you also got this whole area of technology just evolving, changing. How do you tie the two in? Uh, in America, if you are home, you can hear from you, and then we can start to hear from all of our, our panelists. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, that's a very valid question and concern. Um, but um, when I spoke about agility, I think that was applicable in the way you draft your legislation. Um, sometimes it can also make you future proof. Uh, in terms of digitalization and technology, when well, we see enabling legislation now, you're not going to embed a certain technology within your, your, your legislation. What you would do is provide a that allows you to use technology to achieve what you need to do and then leave the, 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 the details or the type of knowledge to the, to the either the um, internal document of revenue agency or through several. So I'll give you an example. When we talk about, um, for example, obtaining information and even um, um, legislation, you wouldn't legislate to say you use this technology mission. You would legislate to say that the revenue authority can, through electronic means, for example, obtain banking information, obtain information from third parties. So two things, the power to obtain that information and how you can obtain it. But you wouldn't specifically legislate in technology. You're legislating what needs to be done. You're giving the power of authority to do it and how it should be done. Um, what you can now do when you want to come to the specifications, that would be a case of maybe manuals within the, the, the revenue authority. You would always find provision that then gives the Commissioner General the power to either produce um, guidelines, practice notes, and all those other things to back up that legislation. That is where you can get into specifications per se, but those don't also usually have specifications. But once you have the power, then you can choose the way you want to, to deploy. So in terms of that, that's what the stating uh, a provide an enabling legislation uh, uh, implied. Another example I can give you is um, with most technology being digital, in some countries you realize that the law hadn't allowed the use of email as an official, when I mean official, you couldn't give uh, fast clarifications of uh, rulings uh, and certain things through an email. It would be accepted as evidence, it would be accepted as official. But with COVID, most countries are saying that there is need to provide for that in your law. So you see where the law will now be, 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 be redrafted to say the revenue authority would be able, would have the power or the authority to be able to receive or to give uh, rulings or receive information or use email, electronic means, not even email. It might just say electronic means um, to communicate and interact with taxpayers. That leaves it open, but now you know whether it's email, whether it's WhatsApp, whether, whatever electronic channel you choose is already covered by that law. So that, that, that's what the enabling um, administrations would look like. Uh, it would look like a specific technology of giving a certain process, but it provides the power, the ability, and how you can do that, while also protecting the rights of the taxpayers in that legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's because everyone who spoke about legislation. Yeah, you got anything to add? Great. Yes, so just as you said, it is a token in most cases um, in the law, just give the authority to that institution to come up with policies and regulations from time to time. So if you look at our paper system law, it was not technically fully contained. But when we did that, our focus was on the large amount of payments. So last year we amended the confirm if you could hear me. Hello? Am I yeah, we, we... Are you done? Yes, we are. Yeah, I'm done. 
Oh yeah, well, you want to hear you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So we were able to have the payment systems act to you know um, have in place the retail payment systems. But what the overall payment systems law gave the central bank was the right to come up with policies and regulations from time to time. So that's how we have the mobile money regulations, the major system regulations, the e-payment regulations that probably mm -hmm. has affected. I mean how many are of the fintech, for example, typically you know, into the space. Okay. Okay. So you just leave the law open and give the institutional right to come up with policies from time to time as being necessary. Because of the evolving nature of technology. Yes, um, from, a, um, from a technical perspective, um, when we talk about legislation, I'm looking for um, protection of intellectual property. Um, and this occurs um, innovation locally, because um, most of the problems we face here can be addressed from here in terms of um, solution, more than just doing copy and paste from what works in Germany and try to force our system here or our people here to work towards that. If you try to do that, there will be more resistance, there will be a low acceptance level, there will be a deeper learning curve, and then more than anything else you hear, the system doesn't work. And that's more than anything that's the, um, this um, user error in most cases. And so, but protecting IP, and uh, I'm just going to talk about this from a very uh, personal perspective, many of my company, where in, um, there, there are many instances where you give ideas um, to entities, whether they're talking about private entities, and they don't like it. They initially said they don't like these ideas, and then two days later, you see them implementing the very same idea that you gave. And there's no recourse on that. So there's need to be potential for innovation locally. I can't talk to any other entity about my ideas, and then um, two days later, um, you see them implementing the very same idea that they had no funding for. So if we protect intellectual property locally, if we spur innovation, we spur technology, and lead to the digital revolution that will drive the economy and so fast that we need to So that's my question. Oh, no, thank you very much. Okay, um, again, great people. I kind of flow open. And again, as I said, uh, the case is there. You saw the regional people already praising us. You know, we got a good idea to bring out. And LRO, all of what they have done, they are not satisfied. They want you to bring out some concern. So let me listen to you. I have some other concern, but let's keep the line open. Yeah, can we get any matter of question, concern, contribution? Yeah. Compliance is a very serious issue that we need to, to 
be able to to, to meet up with our own people. Example again, uh, when we surprised was talking about the, the, the issue of uh, uh, transport to this. If I bought a car, normally people, you have to force people to go and register. Nobody wants to register their cars. So with that idea that we brought in where if you say your car is registered, you have a technology to check and see whether it's registered or not. I mean, it's, it's okay. Now, about the cost of traveling, what do we do? From the Ministry of, uh, uh, how do you call it, from the, um, um, the police, you issue them, um, you issue them a ticket. They go and pay the money to uh, government revenue. Government will generate more and more, more funds from that area. You will see that people will come, but if you are being paid as for violating the law, definitely the next time you will have to pay caution. So that's what I want to emphasize. Thank you. Another concern? Yeah, yeah, my brother. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, I'm, I'm Lawrence Hill and I'm from Accounts and Fiba. Uh, I'm sitting here and I think LRI is doing well. I think there are a lot of ways to talk in the digital economy, digital economy, the digital assistance. But who are these digital assistants for? Are they ready to move the, the level of uh, migration that we're trying to see that we should have And do we need the policy or the law first before doing this? Or do we need to start making Because you, my brother and myself, we're chatting, you know, and every time you check Facebook, it's a space. There is no policy yet to regulate that space. Right? So I'm in the space, I'm, I'm making money, I'm not paying any taxes. Because there is nothing yet to get in this space. So I think once LRA is doing this, you should be thinking more of regulating that space and move on that faster and we can do that integration with a, a LTA so that we have moves faster. And I think the last thing we we'll talk about, it, which will be my question to my sister from um, the central bank, there was a piece of data that did you really say five billion uh, uh, as it relates to the, the, the number of, of people using mobile services and then especially uh, the mobile money? I really think that because that data, that piece of data is useful for us to understand what the level of, of usage is. I think that's my question. Down to the data, the actual um, um, 
conclusion versus the duplication of the data that is 5 million, and then we get the actual people that have bought for data. I think that that's the answer. There are these You know, and they're receiving payments and all of that. But then we have to talk about the future. And that's why I said our focus of this event is to work both on the active uh, Yeah, uh, I was on the first um, the first um, first um, first um, the fellow who talked about the real estate, and then a little bit of just piggyback um, on his um, questions about um, the platforms to develop them for, who are we to them for, and how they can access them. Um, and then it speaks to my point when I initially talked about one digital literacy, and then two employability. So my examples I would give first for the piece about um, the real estate part. So that, that has to do a lot more with digital literacy, um, educating our population that uh, your house can be used as a collaborator if you just bring that house into the formal sector. To say, okay, my house is valued at $20,000. So once I get that mainstream by registering online and paying whatever nominal tax I have to pay, whatever tax I have to pay to LRA, it's not going to be captured that this house is worth this amount. It's in the formal sector now, so that's one aspect. So there has to be a lot of education around that. Um, where we go from community to community, this is asking people that this needs to be done, and this is what you stand to gain from it, just by putting your house online. And then we talk about the employment, uh, employability aspect, where again, people can go around now and start helping people to register. So people usually say, um, again, we build platform, who are we building them for, um, literacy, everything else. By counting, usually, um, if you check the amount of people who play DV, most of them have no computer literacy. But you go to the internet cafe, where someone who has to know how, charge them a fee, and then they play. So that same method can be used across if I have to stay home in Guazon and register my business. There's an internet cafe around it with people who have to know how to help me and they charge a fee. That's business. If I have to put my home on my, there might be a little kid around the area who, if there's a user-friendly app, can come to my house, paint my house on the map, take pictures here and there, and upload it to the LRA platform, and my house is online. I put my home valuation. And that valuation stuff, now, it, it is tricky because it can be two ways. If I say my house is worth 10000 and it's actually worth fifty because I don't want to pay the full tax, that's fine. But there will come a point where I need to borrow money on that same property, now, this is worth 50000 with my valuation that I did earlier when I went to sell my home said it was worth 10000 So it, it's going to be a little tricky, but digital literacy and building the system, it can work. And we can go further than one billion. But there's going to be a point where there has to be a lot of digital literacy. Take it down to the lowest level. And there's going to, it's going to um, just rip it down when we create jobs because most of the kids are very tech savvy. And people can just earn the lunch money by helping grandma to the house online or grandma to be able to apply for certain things from government services. So that was going to be my answer to him and that the first question. All right, I think we time is far spent. We got to be taking care of closing now. Okay, let me take this last question. Huh? Okay. Um, oh. Okay. Okay. All right. It's good that we really hear from We are looking at the question, then she will answer. Actually, it's not a question. Uh, I wanted to show like on the 500 million or the 5 million accounts. Yeah. And I was trying to say that it's possible. And the reason for that is interoperability. Yeah. So if I have MTN, I can pay for orange money, but I can send my sister money who has an orange mobile. So to accommodate for that, I have to sign up for yeah. MTN mobile money, I have to sign up yeah, for orange money, or I have to sign up for paper if I want it from any from the US for same way. So the lack of interoperability is the reason why we have multiple accounts, but the actual usage is maybe low in terms of the value it brings back to the economy or the digital space. 
So I think that's one of the areas that we think like the government of Liberia and Ghana should look at and make sure that this national switch is implemented and service providers should be compared to interconnect so that I can use one service provider for multiple transactions. If there is a fee, you always pay that. But the convenience to take one phone should always be there for people to use. So I just wanted to throw that out. for that point and it also speaks to Lauren's comment regarding the stress that you're currently going through having by adult population with different financial institutions. So you are correct. Um, currently we do not have digital possibility when it comes to the retail payment sector because um, our national switch doesn't exist. Um, but with funding from the World Bank we will start the process. I mean, the process has started already where we began stakeholders engagement. We had our national payment systems forum in October, inside October 26, and all of that soliciting the views of different stakeholders. So the switch will show that um, MTN subscribers or users can seamlessly transact with Orange and Tipe and all of that. So it will be that central platform where the banking institution, the non bank financial institution will all plug, including on um, credit, um, um, credit unions, and all of that. Once they have the appropriate API, they will integrate with the central bank. And one plug will have access to the entire ecosystem. So that project is currently on the way, and I can assure Tiffany that by the middle of 2022, July 2022, we we'll have a national switch running because it's being funded by the World Bank. Yes, so I just wanted to assure, um, or even the LRA, the LRA is going to be integrated as a builder. You know we have had that conversation before, we share with you our technical specification, the agreement and all of that, and have you integrated on the switch for, you know, access to, that is of which um, institution that you've been with, whether a mobile wallet or a fintech or a financial institution or bank, you have access to pay your taxes to the LRA, to the national switch and then for all work credit, timely to the general revenue account. So that's that's just the good news. So then you should be clapping. <laughs> okay, so also she spoke about mobile money limit, since we were talking about that. Um, because of the different KYC levels we have in our current mobile money regulations, it gives the subscribers some limits. You know, based on the ID that you have, you can transact the ball for a particular limit. But if you look at how the central bank um, regulations have evolved over the years, we have started to review most of our regulations. One of which is a testimony to a lot of people here. Before then, when you have informed remittances, they were terminating only at Western Union of Money Grain. We had to go physically with all our money for the counter. But now we are all enjoying direct termination of people with latencies to our wallet or bank account. So that's a regulation that has been amended. Also, we are working on every granting credit to digital platform. So we are working on our digital credit regulation. Um, I know we are supposed to have it go to the FSC for review. Uh, we were working on even what we call the uh, regional integration of payment systems. Uh, the central bank of Gabriel has complete all regulation with other central banks in the West African monetary zone. So by the time we go to the first quarter of 2022, the central bank of Nigeria, financial institutions, the commercial banks, will be able to relate from Liberia to the countries around us. That means um, the likes of Ghana, Nigeria, Guinea, you know, Sierra Leone, the Gambia, and all of that. And the thing is, we are going to be relating in our domestic policy. So the first phase is with the financial institutions. Once we have them integrated, um, that process is probably ongoing. We have shared all of the technical specification documents with them. Very cost effective because we are leveraging our current RTGS. So they don't have to procure an infrastructure. Maybe if you want a bigger server or something, they can do that. But we want to use the system that's currently available. Once we move from there and we implemented our national switch, MTN, Orange, Tipme, um, 
have or uh, we have uh, we have okay I think we have uh, three of them called provisional lessons upon the honor provisional lessons that is a, a printed we will have all of them being able to be made with the sub-region so the first phase is facilitating remittance in our sub-region the next phase is facilitating remittance on the continent so that's that's the whole roadmap so we have the AACP. So it's from the sector by now that that's going on in terms of our, you know, regional integration, the continental integration. So that's just the news. So for the financial institutions, they can be assured that they will be able to make payments in Liberia that was cross border, which will bring additional revenue. So you see, the work bigger is possible because once you have uh, people leveraging, you know, these digital platforms. Um, there will be real-time reporting in terms of value that's being related cross border and then taxes will be paid appropriately. So the one bill is certainly possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so, uh, do we have any other contribution? I'm sure we want to close up at this time. We want to thank the we want to thank the LRA for giving us this opportunity to be part of. This very great, um, uh, the very great initiative. I want to thank our panel, our panelists. Can we please give them a great round of applause for sharing this kind of very powerful news? The first one was that hey, we can get there, but the second, their presentation has made us to know that we can exceed it. And we tell God thank you for that. We tell them, we tell them thank you, um, America, and the other. Panelists on the, on the, on the online, we want to thank you all very much for uh, joining this very good initiative to build this country. At this stage, we will again stand to say thank you very much for getting the LRA, I mean the LRA people for getting the Tax Institute part of this, to be partner with you, and we are with you in going into, your, into the billion for every one of us. So at this stage, we will again close up and turn it over and to see, to please see, I don't know whether we can come up to have a photo with our panelists. Thank you. Come to the end of this uh, live podcast that has to do with the second national revenue symposium, where uh, it was launched by His Excellency uh, Dr. George Monawia. What we just witnessed was the second and last uh, panel. For the discussion on hello so we want to say thank you to our panelists once again for taking out the one of the digital digitalization once again and so on this platform it's been a very long day like to bring this and to this end. juncture will now call on attorney uh, as I have been informed that this continue to tomorrow as well and we hope to bring you the continuation tomorrow. So keep following Spawn TV Live as we bring you all of the happenings in and around Liberia. So once again, we'd like to say thanks to our viewers. Keep following us. 
today as we bring you the best of information. Once again, my name is Francis, and now to go, do have yourself a wonderful day. Bye-bye. What's next? What do you